ladies and gentlemen next up we have with us Rui Vera software engineer at radanalytics.io and he's going to be talking about building streaming recommendation engines on spark i request you all to have a seat and welcome Rui Hi everyone thank you very much can you hear me no hello Yeah, so I'll use this one. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. So, hi, everyone. Thank you very much for, for coming. So, my name is Hoi, uh, uh, as you heard now. Thank you. Right? Okay, sorry about that. Thank you. So, my name is Hoi, as you just heard, and I'd like to talk a little bit today about uh, building streaming, uh, distributed streaming recommendation engines on Spark. And uh, I'd like to talk a little bit about batch uh, streaming, uh, batch recommendation engines. So that's a common uh, approach of, of doing recommendation engines. And also how easy it is on one way to build these kind of distributed uh, recommendation engines. But on the other hand, how building them in a streaming and distributed way can be uh, tricky. So you have some, some roadblocks you might stumble upon. So, I'll introduce the concept of uh, collaborative filtering, which is the most common way of, of producing recommendation engines. And I'll talk about the two variants, which is uh, the batch uh, alternating with squares and streaming alternating with squares. I also introduce a little bit about uh, uh, Patches Park. I'm assuming that some of you are familiar with, and I'll talk about uh, an implementation on top of the Patches Park called Distributed Streaming ALS. And finally, I'll talk a bit about how to deploy uh, this kind of uh, setups on on a modern cloud environment such as uh, OpenShift. So what is collaborative filtering? So, I mean, first let's talk about recommender systems. So recommender systems are a popular method of matching historical data from users, uh, products, and the rating that you have, so the connection between the, those users and products. Usually you have like a unique relation between a user, a product, and a rating. So say, if you go to a, a movie uh, website where you want to see new movies or buy a new movie, you might see some, some movies there, you recommend one. So if you give it five stars, you're going to have a unique uh, relation between yourself, the user, the product, the movie, and the rating that you just get. And in this jargon, collaborative filtering, collaborative just means using the, all of the data that you have globally from all the users, and filtering is basically predicting. So you're basically doing predictions on the data you already have. So in a way, collaborative filtering, we use it in our everyday uh, life, so, uh, and it's quite common sense if you think about it. So let's assume the main idea behind it is let's assume you have two groups of people. So one of which is group A, which is a group of people with which you share a, a, a musical taste, so everything they like, you usually like. And you have a group B, which is people which you don't share any kind of musical taste, so everything they like in music you hate. So if group A recommends you an album and group B recommends you another album, so which one are you probably going to buy? So you're probably going to buy Group A, right? So yeah, so that's basically collaborative filtering in a way. So as a bonus question, if Group B says that an album is really good, or it says an album is really bad, sorry, does, it, does that mean you're going to like it? You know, because you, you really don't have like a, an informative relation between that data and the one between the group you have. So it's a different kind of relation. So you can't really say you're going to like that album. So one of the most popular methods for collaborative filtering is alternating waste squares. And in ALS, uh, we assume that we have all of the data organized as a sequential uh, ordering of users and products. And we can build a kind of matrix. Uh, it's a natural way of displaying this data. So we have a matrix representing all the ratings. And this is a, a sparse matrix. So obviously, you're going to have some ratings missing from there. So not all of the users rate all of the products. And each entry represents a unique relation between the user and the product. So what are we doing with ALS in a nutshell is basically try to factorize this big ratings matrix into two latent factor matrices called, we're just going to call them U and P here. And these two factors, when they multiply back together, they're going to give an approximation of the ratings matrix. And that approximation is going to include all the ratings that we're missing. And that's going to be a prediction of the ratings that we're missing. 
So one classical way of doing this is using a batch method, right? So in a batch method, what we do is the factorization is, is done by defining a loss function. So basically defining a loss function uh, having an error term there, which is the difference between the actual rating that you have and the, predicted, the, the prediction of the rating you're going to have. And you have some regularization terms, right? And this loss function has to be minimized. Unfortunately, using ALS, this loss, this actual minimization problem has a closed form, form solution. So you can actually set the derivatives of the loss function in order of u and p to zero. You have a nice set of linear uh, equations which you can solve by iterations. And so that's quite handy, right? So the way we do it is we fix one of the fa factor matrices, we solve the estimator in order of the other one, and then we just iterate the process going backs and forwards. We having one fix and the other fix. So eventually this process is going to converge and you're going to have a very good approximation of the, of the ratings matrix. And finally, in the end, what you have is something like this. So you still have the data that you actually have, and in red you have uh, an approximation. And what this approximation means mathematically is that these values are going to be the ones which actually minimize that ALS recursion, right? So it's going to be, you, you can bet that it's probably going to be, if you have enough data a good, and enough iterations, a good approximation. So to visualize this, let's imagine a very quirky shop. So you have a shop where you have 300 products. You only sell 300 products. And you only have 300 customers, right? And to be even more quirky, each customer can give a rating in 8 bits. So you can give any rating from 1 to 256, right? And as we're humans and we visualize better things, patterns in colors, and we're doing numbers, we have to send a palette to these numbers, right? So I think you know where this is going. So we can build a ratings matrix that looks like something we can see, right? Okay, so this is our, our, going to be our ratings matrix. So if we use ALS to solve uh, this, how do we go about it? So first we fill the latent factors with random numbers. So obviously if you fill them with random numbers, your in initial approximation is going to be a random matrix. So that makes sense. And then you start the iteration. And as you go about the iteration, you can see that, well, it's doing actually quite a good job, right? So after a few iterations, it's actually approximating the ratings matrix that we had originally. So, okay, it works, but it's expected to work in this case. So this is probably the simplest case of ALS you can imagine. So it's a very small data set. You have all the ratings, you know all the ratings, and it's not a distributed system, so no traps to, to fall upon. So yeah, of course it's gonna work. So you might be thinking, well, this is all nice, but we can do this in a streaming way, right? So if we, we're filling, we're approximating that matrix, we get new observations, we get new ratings, or we get new users, or a new product is released, we can just recalculate the whole thing, right? Well, yes, you can. But in one way, that's not going to be streaming just because of two technicalities. One of which is you have to keep the whole of the data. So you're not using a streaming implementation because obviously you get new data, but you have to store the entirety of the historical data. You can't approximate any new matrix with just that one new rating that you had. And secondly, if you want to do this in your real time, it might be a bit problematic because you have to imagine if you're a shop or a company that has millions of users and millions of products, obviously it's going to be a bit tricky to recalculate the whole thing in real time. So how do we go about it? So we want to look at a method that allows us to do this factorization with just one rating or a few ratings at a time. And fortunately, there is a method for that. It's called the stochastic ring descent applied to the factorization. And the specific method we're going to use is biostochastic ring descent to factorize the ratings matrix. So what's the difference between stochastic gradient descent and match method? So basically, we introduce a new concept, and this is uh, the concept of bias. So here we have a bias between x and y. So x is a user, y is a product. And uh, the, bias between, the bias associated with a product and a user is going to be mu, which is the average, the global average of the biases, of, of the ratings that you have, sorry. And you have going to have bx, which is basically how much does the rating deviate uh, from the, the, the average uh, you have for all of the users or from all of the products. And then the new uh, approximated rating is just going to be the batch case plus this new term, so plus the new biases. So if we replace this into the, the, the loss function, so we can just devise a new loss function for the, 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 the streaming case. But it, now we're just going to have the new uh, predictions in the loss function plus some regularization terms uh, that you're not going to go into them. 
So calculating the field gradients is quite expensive, so we, we, we're going to calculate them for a single observation. So we, as you can see from the update of the biases and the, the update of the factors, we can do this uh, iteratively, but just with one observation at a time. And that's exactly what we want, right? So provided we have a single rating, uh, the rating of, uh, of uh, user X and product Y, we can update the biases as well as the latent factors, and that's going to allow us to do the factorization in real term. And uh, an interesting thing is that this method also uh, has a convergence property as, as the batch method has. So the practical difference is, in terms of the streaming data, is, is obvious now, I hope, is that in both methods, the, obje the objective is to estimate the latent factors, right? But in one method, so in, in the batch method, whenever you get a new observation, you're going to have to recalculate the factors with the entirety of the data. Whereas in the streaming uh, version, whenever you get a new observation, you just update the gradients that relates to a specific row or a specific column, so the user and product column, of the, that specific user and, and product. And it is important to note that under, under a certain point of view, these methods aim at exactly the same thing. So they both aim at calculating the latent factors and from that making the predictions. It's just the way they use the data is going to be significantly different. So let's look at an illustration with the same data set uh, of the, the streaming case, and we're going to use the same manufactured ratings uh, data. And as you can see, the conversion here seems to be happening, but slower. That, that, that is to be expected, because now we're not using the entirety of the data, just one observation at a time. But in the end, we're going to see a kind of conversion to, to a single result. We're getting a good approximation of the ratings matrix. And again, this is a simple example. So this is with a small data set in a local machine. There's no distribution happening. But we don't want this, right? We want to try this with big data sets in production. So we want to actually implement something that works at scale, so something that might work with big amounts of data. And to do that, we're going to use Spark. So I, I'm assuming that uh, some of you are familiar with Spark. So who here has worked with Apache Spark? Yeah, not, not that many people. <laughs> okay, so I'm just going to do like the 10 second mandatory introduction of, of Apache Spark. I hope I hope your answers uh, describes faithfully what Spark does. So Spark uh, Spark is a, fr a framework that allows you to do uh, distributed uh, calculations at scale, and it provides several core data structures, such, such as uh, resilient data set, distributed data sets, and data frames, and data sets, and the RDD, the Resilient Distributed Data Set, is an immutable distributed type collection of objects. And what does that mean? It means that when you create one of these RDDs, they're actually mapped across your cluster, right? And as they're immutable, what happens is you can actually map your, your, your computations to each of the clusters. So the calculations are done in parallel at the clusters, and then you just aggregate the results back. So this allows for... for uh, for a very natural way of distributing computations if you can translate your algorithm in this kind of distributed immutable operations. And for the streaming ALS application, we're going to use uh, RDDs as the core data structure. So Apache Spark already uh, provides in, in its MLlib uh, library uh, an implementation of ALS, so of alternating with squares, but it's a batch implementation of alternating with squares. But it, it is a very uh, performant one. It works very well. If, 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 if it works for you, just use it by all means. And it has a very simple API. So basically, if you want to train a model, you just, use a, you just need a few quantities. So basically, you need uh, what is called a rating, and a rating is just a wrapper around the, the quantities you mentioned, so the user ID, the product ID, and the rating. And you have the ratings, which is just uh, your matrix, is just an RDD of ratings. You also need a rank, which is uh, it corresponds to the to the number of elements in each of the columns or rows of the latent factors that we mentioned. And you also need iterations, which is basically a hard stop on how, when should uh, the iterative process stop. So this is quite useful because you actually can know that the problem is computationally bound. So you know it's not, it's not going to last forever. You can say, well, after uh, 100 iterations, this is going to be a good enough approximation. You can stop. And it allows you to pass also some uh, regularization terms, as, we met, as we've seen, uh, such as double. I'm oh, sorry.
So the way to train a model is quite uh, straightforward, as I mentioned. So basically, you just pass to the ALS class, into, there's an ALS object, you just pass the ratings, the rank, the iterations, and the lambda. And what you get back is basically a class called matrix factorization model, which is, is just a wrapper around the two latent, uh, the, the latent the factor matrices that, that we've seen. And to this is to work obviously in a batch setting, right? But to, to actually work in a in a streaming implementation, you're going to need a streaming data source. And the streaming data source that we decided to use is uh, Spark's discretized streams, or D streams, and they basically work as mini batches of RDDs over, over a certain uh, time window. So basically, you're going to get batches of resilient distributed data sets over a certain frequency and time window, and then you can process, you can apply the process to each of these mini batches. So, I mean, an important thing, I'm sorry if I can just scroll back. So an important thing to notice about, uh, or advantage of these uh, discretized streams or these streams, is that we now, if we use this on the streaming ALS, we no longer need to keep the entirety of the data in memory or, or even access it. So basically, if you can imagine the case that I mentioned that we have millions of products and millions of users, now if you get a mini batch with just a few ratings, you don't need to, say, read the database with uh, several hundred million ratings to review the whole process. You can just use the data that you have in that mini batch. So we wanted to, since the the MLweb API is quite straightforward and intuitive. We wanted to use the same uh, API on the streaming on the, the streaming ALS, so we're going to use the same uh, type of commands. And the way we're going to do this is initially, when we don't have any model or data, we're going to create a model with the initial uh, RDD, with the initial mini batch, and then from that model, we're going to update it with the uh, uh, mini batches that are going to co they're going to come afterwards. So we're going to be continuously updating the, the model as new mini batches of data arrive. So what do we need to train the model? So now I'm just going to give you a few of the steps, actually like the algorithmic steps of going from that initial mini batch to a train model. It's just going to be a couple of steps. Uh, they're going to go into some detail, but hopefully it's going to give you an idea of how it is tricky to implement like this kind of algorithm in a distributed way. But in a way, the flip side of it is that you get obviously a distributed recommendation engine, which is quite performant. So what do we need to get the model? So as we seen from, if you remember from the initial slides, from the formulas, so we need actually these quantities to have a trained model. So once we have them, we can say we have a trained model and we can perform predictions. So let's start with looking at uh, user latent factors. So these operations are going to be identical from one mini batch to the other. So the same set of operations you're going to do on the first mini batch, you just repeat them with the new data and you get to continuously update the model. So to calculate the, the user latent factors, so what we need is, like in the batch ALS, we get uh, an RDD of ratings, right? And this corresponds to the ratings that each user gave to a product, right? And the first thing we're going to do is we're going to split this RDD into two RDDs, so one key by user and one key by product, right? And this will allow us to, to compute the latent factors. Now we're going to do them. So you have to just to keep in mind that this is the first initial step. We have no model. We have no latent factors. We don't have anything. So the first thing that we do is for each of these two RDDs that we created, we're going to generate a random feature vector. And the way we're going to do it, we just create a feature vector of rank uh, R, so the, the rank that we decided, and we just fill it with random uniform values. And with each of those feature vectors, we're going to associate a random bias as well. right? So we can do that. It's quite easy. So the next step is to, because we actually split the RDD into users and products, keys uh, one by users and one by products. We might have some duplicated users or products in this RDD. So you can imagine the case where if you uh, rate the two movies, obviously you're going to be on two entries of this RDD, right? So twice in the, in the users and twice in the products. So what actually we're going to do, we're going to join these ratings, which in turn will return the data set consisting of product IDs, user IDs, ratings, and user factors. Right? So we join them, and we get to return is we have these mappings between the user, the product, the bias, and the, and the, the feature vectors. Right? 
So finally, it's just a couple of steps more. You can see it's actually quite simple. What we do is we swap the RDD keys. So instead of having one key by user or, or product, we just reverse the key. And we take this intermediate data set and we join it with the other feature vector. So now we have a complete uh, RDD in which each row or each item of it is going to include all the biases and all the waiting, all, all the feature vectors for each combination of products and user IDs and the ratings. So now we can calculate the global bias, right? So if you remember, the global bias is simply the average of all the ratings that we have. So we can do that easily in Spark, right? So we just calculate an average for all the ratings that we have. So finally, we just need to now calculate the user-specific bias and the product-specific specific bias. And that's quite uh, simple as well. So, so we've seen before, we can update this. Uh, we can update the bias by using just this gradient term, right? So the new bias is just going to be the old bias plus this new gradient term. And to calculate the gradient, we just need these quantities that we have here. We need the error, so that's the difference between your rating and the prediction. We need the gamma and the lambda. We have those. Those are uh, model parameters. So we have everything that we need. So let's start with calculating uh, the gradient. So now that we have each item of this RDD, for each one of them, we calculate. I'm sorry, I just skipped. So now. Right. So we can cal calculate the prediction, right, because we have the feature vectors, and now we can calculate the error. So the error is going to be simply the rating less the prediction, so you can calculate the error. So now that we have these quantities, if you remember, just the, the expression of the gradients, it's quite straightforward to calculate. So basically what do we do? We basically uh, take the RDDs that we have for the latent factors for the users and the products, and now we just key them by user and product, and we do an aggregated sum for each of those uh, split RDDs that we have, right? So now we get the gradient for the users, we get the gradient for the latent, user latent factors, and we get the gradient for the products and the gradient for the, uh, for the product latent factors. So now we have all the quantities we need to say we have a model. So we just sum the gradients so that we have one gradient for each user and product, and that's it. So you might say, well, that seems uh, a lot of steps, but that's, that's what you have, that's the price you have to pay for doing this computation in a distributed way. So you might think, well, now that we have them, we have the, the latent factors, we can perform easily predictions. But what if you get new observations? Or what if you get new data? What if you get new data from a project we've never seen before or a project we've seen before? So how do we deal with that? So you might remember that uh, we trained the model with nothing in the first initial mini patch, right? <laughs> Sorry. Right. So we train the model with nothing in the initial mini batch, but now we just carry over the model to the next mini window and we just with the next mini batch and we just train it with the with the ratings that we have. So let's look at the case where now we assume we get a mixture of data from ratings we've seen before. So imagine you rate a new movie, you rate a movie last week, but you rate a new movie, but some user decides, goes into the system, is the first time he's trying to rate something, or he's rating a movie that didn't exist before, how do we deal with it? So let's assume here we just assume that the, the cells in red are ratings that you haven't seen before, right? And the others are cells that, that for users or products that you've seen before. So what we do now is instead of assigning random feature vectors for each of the products that we see, for all of the products that we get, we basically do a full outer join between the RDDs that we produce and the latent factors that we, from the data RDDs and the latent factors that we have. So that allows us to keep the RDDs that we already have with the feature uh, factors that we already have. And for the ones that we've never seen before, now we can do exactly the same steps as before and create new feature vectors and random and biases as well. So in this way, you can deal any kind of situation that arises, right? 
So how does this behave in the real world? So we decided to test this with some real data, and to do that, we use the Movie Lens data set, which is a quite widely used data set in the uh, recommendation engine research field. And it actually has two variants, so a small variant, which is quite good for prototyping. So it has uh, ratings that users actually gave to movies in a small file, so 100,000 ratings is quite good to do some quick prototyping of algorithms. And it has a full variant with 26 million ratings, which is quite good if you want to do some more in-depth analysis of the performance of an algorithm. And uh, the data actually has uh, several fields of interest, but we're just going to use a few ones from this data set, which is the user ID, the movie ID, and the rating. So that's basically what we're going to use. No, no, I, I was just going to to go into how, how we set up the whole thing to train the, the streaming case. So yeah, that's a good question, but, but I'm just going to explain your, your question in a second. Um, so how, how are we going to train this? So in answer of the question. So first we train a batch uh, model so we can have like a kind of baseline so we can compare it to the streaming version. And we just use the Spark ML leap out of the box uh, batch ALS. So we split the data into 80%, 20%, and we basically train the data in one of the splits, and then we just keep part of that data set to the side so we, we know that we're going to use exactly the same uh, two splits on one method and the other, so we have a fair comparison. And we calculate some kind of error measure uh, to, to have some kind of metric of how well the, the model is performing. So in this case, we use uh, the root mean squared error. So we, it's easy to calculate in Spark, given the, if you have the predictions and, and, and the original data. And oops, sorry. OK, so yeah, we, we, we measure the root mean squared error, and then we're going to compare the root mean squared error of the streaming version against this one. So how do we set up the, the, the actual streaming uh, testing case? So we, use, we train this on OpenShift. And the idea was to use uh, some kind of message broker like Kafka, and we actually use Kafka to uh, simulate a data stream. And we use uh, Streamzy to do that, which is a project that allows you to deploy uh, Kafka uh, on, on OpenShift. And we use uh, Oshinko, which is a tool from radanalytics.io, which allows you to easily deploy uh, Spark clusters on OpenShift. And basically what we just did is we read, in answer to your question, so we read the, the entirety of the data, uh, and then we just basically replayed it through Kafka as to simulate a stream, right? And we use uh, we use uh, windows of five seconds with a thousand observations each, but this is just for convenience. For, it's just because it's convenient for practical purposes. You can use whatever you want, but uh, I mean, realistically, if you use like one observation per minute or something, you're probably going to wait several months or years to wait for this to finish. So we just use that for practical reasons. And uh, uh, an important note is that the best parameters for the batch model are not going to be necessarily the, ba the best uh, parameters for the streaming model. Obviously, they're completely different or very different algorithms. But also for, uh, for convenience and for practical purposes, we use the same parameters in both models. But more, more in the next slides, I'm going to go into how to estimate hyperparameters for, for a streaming ALS version. So this is a result that we had. So in the horizontal dashed line is the root mean squared error for the batch version. And the blue squiggly, squiggly line is the, the root mean squared error for the streaming version. And you can see, well, it's, it's quite it's quite good in the sense that it is what we were expecting. So uh, in the beginning, you don't have much data for the streaming version. So it's kind of all over the place. But as time goes by, it does seem to be converging to a, a value that which is in the same region as the batch uh, version. So in the end, both the batch and the streaming uh, process the, the same amount of data. So, so it's, it's a reasonable uh, result. But you might think, well, this is all very good, and streaming ALS is like a silver bullet. It's like, you know, magically solves every problem we might have. Well, that's not the case, obviously. So some things which are very important to consider when using streaming ALS. 
So a problem with, but and this is not particular of streaming ALS, is for all ALS and many machine learning models, is a cold start problem. So basically, the cold start problem refers to an initial point in your uh, model training where you don't have enough data to make uh, any kind of insightful inference or prediction. So you can imagine those slides I showed of the Mona Lisa in the beginning. If you remember, the latent factors are completely filled with random data. So the approximation is going to look completely random. So if you just have a few observations, that's not going to change that. So it's going to look pretty much random. So always be careful when providing, because you might feel tempted to, since you have a streaming version, I'm going to start serving away predictions immediately. So that might not be the best idea. And something you might do to mitigate that is to so if you have loads of data, if you're a big company and you have loads of data, first train the streaming model on offline with a big chunk of data and then start serving in a streaming way, right? So, but, but bootstrap the model with, with a big chunk of data. Don't start from zero and immediately start serving predictions with like, say, five ratings or something like that. Uh, that might be, uh, so the predictions might be rubbish in the predictions to get back. So another thing to consider is hyperparameter estimation. Excuse me. So hyperparameter estimation, excuse me, in the batch ALS is quite straightforward because you can do like a parameter grid, you can do a grid search for parameters. Uh, for several uh, sets of parameters, and then you decide, well, parameter set D is the best for my data. And then at some point in the future, if you want to retrain the whole thing, you, you can do it. Like I say, after two months of having this model running, you say, well, it's not behaving very well. Let me try to retrain it with uh, a rank of double size, something like that. Then you can do that perfectly. You take all of the data, you retrain the model, and that's it. That's fine. Because you have all of the data. But with the streaming case, that's not the case. Because when you get the data, you, you discard the data. I mean, in, in theory, obviously. But what I mean is, if, you, if you're in a position in the streaming AOS that you need to refer back to the entirety of the data and retrain the model, then it's not really a streaming version. You're, you're doing a batch, kind of batch hybrid streaming version. So what you do is uh, you have a set of parameters, you get the data, and then if you want to try a new set of parameters, you can only retrain the model with that new data that you have because you, you discard it of the previous data. So you can't really do what you do in batch AOS. So a possible solution around that is to perform like a parallel grid search. What you do is you have a bunch of models in the beginning, you train them with a set of parameters each, and then as time goes by, you see which of these models or which of these set of parameters gave me the model which is least performant, and then you prune that model from your search. You say, well, I'm just going to keep these three models and keep doing that. This has an obvious drawback, which is it might be computationally expensive to train lots of models simultaneously. And another thing is there's no theoretical result, result that actually guarantees you that a model that you discarded in the very beginning might not be actually the best model in the future when you have more data. It might be the best set of parameters for that specific small chunk of data that you had. Problem to train parameters with uh, the streaming version. Uh, finally, there's a consideration of performance. So in these kind of models, you're going to do, uh, as you see, lots of joins. You're going to have lots of data shuffling around the partitions. So you have to be really careful of optimizing these kind of algorithms. Um, Spark, Apache Spark does something very clever with a batch version in which they do something called the blocked ALS. Basically, what they do is that they pre-calculate the amount of outgoing and incoming, uh, outgoing and ingoing, sorry, uh, connections between uh, the chunks of RDDs for the feature, the latent factors, so they can minimize the amount of data shuffling that happens. So that's, it's a quite clever algorithm. But a naive implementation of streaming ALS will give you nothing like that. So, so you have, on top of this algorithm, you have to think of some clever strategies for, to minimize data shuffling. And also something that for the more seasoned Apache Spark developer might raise some, you know, uh, so make some alarm bells ring, is the fact that you, you might do some ad hoc random access fetching of RDDs to calculate some quantities. So say, if you're, if you're an algorithm, you find yourself calculating the predicted rating for a specific user and product many times, keep in mind that to do that, you're going to have to access a specific uh, 
row uh, between commas or, or column of an RDD, and that's not a really that's kind of an eye type pattern in Spark. So it might be ended, and if you end up if your code ends up looking like this, having to do lots of lookups and stuff like that, so possibly it is good to just rethink your strategy of doing the predictions. So. So this was basically the, the explanation of a generic uh, Spark, uh, Spark AOS streaming algorithm. So if you want to check out more stuff about uh, streaming algorithms or Apache Spark or OpenShift, I invite you to, to take a look at my blog. This is a specific post on, on streaming AOS if you want to see it. And if you want to play around with distributed algorithms uh, on Apache Spark, uh, on OpenShift, or on, on the cloud, I strongly recommend that you you go to the radanalytics.io website. You have uh, several use cases for uh, intelligent applications, machine learning at scale, which are very good, very uh, well documented. You can you can actually learn how these things work just by by reading the source code and documentation. And they actually have some ready use cases you can actually deploy. Like uh, they have a microservice oriented uh, recommendation engine built with a batch OS version of Spark, which is uh, very 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 uh, interesting. So I thoroughly recommend you. So that is it for me, and I thank you very much for your time. No questions? Do you want to go for questions? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm sorry, if anyone has any questions, sorry, I thought that was a given. But <laughs> no, I can help you with. Oh, it's fine, yeah, don't worry, don't worry.